guest tonight, our speaker tonight, is Luis Vivanco, who is from the Cultural Anthropology Department at the University of Vermont, where he is the chair. He has degrees from Dartmouth and Princeton, and he came to UVM in 1997. As academics are required to do, he has written many articles and four books so far. His research focus is on cultural issues related to the green movement, including the rise of sustainable transportation movement and alternatives to automobiles. He has published extensive scholarship on bicycle culture, politics, and history. Um, he has a program for his talk, an outline of his talk, in this little booklet if you don't have one. Look around, raise your hand, and get you one. Um, Luis, you're on. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Liz. <clears throat> <clears throat> Thank you all so much. I'm very pleased to be here tonight and, um, <clears throat> and congratulate you on uh, the extension of the uh, Lamoille Valley Rail Trail. This is um, um, uh, really exciting for those of us uh, from Burlington because we can now pretty much cross the state. Um, so, um, so, well, I want to talk tonight about uh, the history of bicycles here in Vermont. And um, it sort of... I should probably give you some background as to why I am, because you heard I'm a cultural anthropologist, and uh, what is a cultural anthropologist doing talking about the history of bicycles in Vermont? Well, about 10 years ago, I wrote this book, and it was based on ethnographic field work in a number of cities that were beginning to take bicycles quite seriously, Bogota, Colombia, uh, was one of those, and uh, some work in Denmark, and then in Burlington, Vermont. And this was, for me, an opportunity to explore something that kind of took me by surprise at one point, which was my everyday practice, uh, since I was five years old, of riding a bicycle for fun, for errands, for whatever, had suddenly become green. And I had a background as a scholar of environmental movements in Latin America. And it really raised a question, what's so green about riding a bicycle? And so um, I, I don't know, I got a modest question from our Transportation Research Center, said, hey, we're doing some research on bicycle transportation, would you like to join in on, on that? And I was like, what, what, what does that mean? You know, research on bicycle transportation. And so once I've kind of figured out this, okay, I'm a scholar of green movements, maybe there's something to this, let me, let me ask, right? Uh, does it mean that you're espousing some kind of environmental values by getting on your bike? And in a time when the bicycle is seen as a vehicle for a small planet, I thought that might ring true for some possibilities. So I throw myself into field work and uh, find out that the, there's just richness beyond thinking of it purely in environmental terms, but in terms of the bicycle as an object that transforms you, that you transform. Uh, so thinking about the, the, the bicycle as a new old thing, you know, we're seeing a real renaissance in bicycling in the last 10, 12 years, but I also knew in the background that it was an old thing, right? That, there was a time in the late 19th century when bicycles were really seen as one of the most exciting and revolutionary things to come around. And so when I was writing this book, I was working on my chapter that looks at Burlington and the contemporary politics of bike lanes and bike groups and activism and so on. And I thought, well, I need to know something. Maybe I'll write a few paragraphs about the history of bicycling in Burlington. And so I naively thought I could just walk into our special collections and there would be, you know, some article that somebody had written. <laughs> and uh, I, was, uh, I was just awoken with this sort of like, no, Luis, you're going to have to do it on your own. Nobody has done anything with this. And I was handed a, a slim folder with some newspaper articles from the 80s <laughs> and 1980s. And I thought, okay, well, um, someone I hope will teach me how to do this stuff because I can do field work 
as an ethnographer, but I had, hadn't really done much historical archival work. So I sort of submitted myself to the, to the special collections librarians. They taught me how to access, you know, digitized newspaper collections and photo collections and diaries and town meetings, uh, uh, sorry, uh, town histories and Sanborn fire maps. I saw you have one over here at the, at the Historical Society building. So, you know, I, I sort of threw myself into this and all of this stuff that I was getting into occupies about a, two paragraphs in this, you know, 150 page book. So I just thought, oh, there's such a mountain of stuff here. And, and um, I, I also got curious about what was happening in the rest of Vermont, right? You know, I knew a lot about Burlington, but what was happening in the rest of Vermont? So I developed this talk because I thought, I gotta share this. This is such rich and fascinating and entertaining material. Um, and so uh, this is the talk and what we're gonna do is, you know, talk about the, the ways in which the bicycle was transforming people's lives here. But I wanna reassure you that you don't have to be a bicycle nut like I am to enjoy this material. Um, uh, as an anthropologist, I, I use the bicycle as a lens into social changes that were happening. And, and in fact, Hardwick is a really great story because at the time when bicycles are really exploding, Hardwick itself is also really changing dramatically. And a lot of that social change that plays out in a town like Hardwick Bicycles are just part of the scene and they're seen as this progressive new thing that uh, a lot of people are aspiring to get a hold of. Um, so I want to start us with uh, uh, some background on bicycles because we're going to talk about three of these bicycles of the four that are here. And it'll be just a quick orientation to the history of bicycles uh, as a technology. So at the very top there, you will see uh, the Drazine. And by the way, this is one of the first pages in that little program to the uh, talk. But in 18, you know, you all, you've all heard of the year without summer, right? There was a, a volcano in Indonesia that blows over. Northern Europe, Vermont, you know, they, they have a year without summer. And there was a German nobleman by the name of Karl von Dres who had long dream, dreamt of inventing a horseless carriage. Um, he never quite succeeded at that, but when this year without summer came, he saw all these horses dying because the oat harvest had failed in northern Germany, and he said, ah, now, now's my chance. I'm gonna invent a horse replacement. And so he creates this thing out of wagon wheels. It's called a Drazine. It has lots of names, a Laufmaschine, because it was a running machine. So you would straddle it and you would run. The steering was very rudimentary, um, and to the point where the earliest ones you could hardly steer. You just got in some tracks and hoped for the best. <laughs> um, and there were little uh, foot rests so you could put your feet up and go. They became quite a fad in New, uh, New York even, in London, in Paris, and uh, the dandies of the time uh, appropriated these things. And they were, for a time, they were called dandy chargers. Um, and these dandy chargers were quite a fad. Um, they kind of would reappear periodically throughout the 1840s. And then in the 1860s, there was a Paris wagon wheel or wagon shop uh, where one of these old Drazines shows up. And the historical debate is bloody and crazy, but there's somebody in this shop the, uh, in Paris uh, put some cranks and pedals on the front of this and thereby created this, the so-called velocipede. Um, and by, so by 1868, we have these things and they were called bone shakers because they were about 150 pounds. They're wooden, w w heavy wood, wagon wheels. <clears throat> and so you would trundle along, pedaling your way, and they were incredibly bumpy, so they would <laughs> shake your bones. Um, the first word bicycle, the first time you really see the word bicycle being used is in association with these bone shakers. Um, in 1871, so not long afterwards, so there's just a really rapid evolution of this technology. And people want to go fast on these bone shakers. So the way you go faster on a direct drive vehicle is you grow that front wheel, 
right? But of course, if you're already at 150 pounds and you're using wagon wheels, this is going to become impossible. So you see real technological innovation happening with wheels and, and um, you see the tension uh, based spoked wheel invented for this purpose. So these the wheels can get much, much larger and um, uh, and then you see the bending of steel tubing. So this is a really tremendous jump forward technologically. And these become very, very successful. They're the high wheeler, the penny farthing, yeah, it's often how we hear them, the ordinary. Um, those front wheels could be as, as many as 50 inches, even bigger. Uh, and, and people really were uh, doing all kinds of incredible things on these. Racing, there was an incredible fascination with bicycle racing on these things. And the very first bicycle to go around the world was on one of these. Um, in 1884-5, a guy named Thomas Stevens, who came and gave a talk. He was a British-American guy. He gave a talk in St. Johnsbury on this ride around the world. He wrote a book called Around the World on a Bicycle. Um, it's a harrowing story because there weren't roads. <laughs> um, and so he was using uh, uh, train tracks many, many times uh, and he would cross trestle bridges and tra he would, train would come and he writes about how he would have to, he couldn't get to the end when the train is coming and so he would kind of go over the edge and hang on to the trestle while holding on to his bicycle below him while the thing rumbles overhead. So uh, you might have guessed these things are incredibly dangerous. <laughs> that term header comes about because people would shoot over them, they would hit a bump, they would you know, fly over and, and actually kill themselves. And, and lots of injuries occurred with these. So the race was on to figure out a safer bicycle. And in 1885, the guy who basically invents this, a guy named James Starley, invents this. It's called the safety bicycle for obvious reasons. <laughs> it's much safer and uh, it's basically what we do have today, right? It's a, uh, we have a version of this um, and this thing becomes even more exciting after 1888 when an a Irish doctor named John Dunlop uh, has a sickly son who enjoys the bicycle, the wheel it was, it was, as it was often called uh, and, uh, but didn't like the bumpy, bumpiness of the solid rubber tires and so John Dunlop invents the pneumatic tire um, uh, which we all know so well today. Um, so this is a, we'll see the, the three of these bicycles um, and so let's dive in. So in the 1860s, is, is in 1869, so just really a year or two after you see the first bone shakers, you see them coming to Vermont. A velocipede school opens up in 1869 in St. Albans. And here's a woman riding a tricycle velocipede um, in 1869. They would parade through the streets of St. Albans on velocipedes. Uh, Montpelier was also experiencing a bit of a velocipede craze, which is so interesting that, that th these things came up here so early. Um, they first came with circus troops. The circus troops loved these things. Um, but clearly uh, some people got excited about them. And in fact, in Montpelier, the Montpelier Manufacturing Company made children's velocipedes, uh, manufactured them. Um, by the 1880s, we see, uh, like this guy, Nellie Ross from Rutland, uh, uh, riding on the high wheels. And uh, these were very expensive. They were six months wages for a typical, you know, working person. Um, so the people who rode these bicycles were elites and they organized themselves into clubs, wheelmen's clubs. And uh, they typically rode their bikes together in military formation. And you can see a kind of military bearing with their uniforms and they had very beautiful elaborate emblems for their clubs. And uh, they created quite excitement uh, as they would race through a town in their big military formation with a bugler calling out moves and a captain in the front and a sergeant and so on. So they were organized like cavalry units. Um, and so by the 1880s, these things are really catching up here, catching speed here in Vermont. But it's not until the 1890s that we see the real beginnings of what 
has been called the bicycle craze. Um, some people call it the first bicycle boom. Uh, the second was in the 70s. The third was in the 80s with the mountain bike. And some people say we're in the fourth bicycle boom right now as bikes are taking over more and more as a form of transportation in cities. But in the 1890s, you see you know, women taking to the wheel and uh, celebrating new sort of arguments about their freedoms in the public sphere by riding bicycles. Uh, bicycles are becoming very inexpensive, well not very, but they're becoming a lot more inexpensive because the bicycle industry really sh takes off and it becomes a, an incredibly productive and prestigious industry in the Northeast. And uh, uh, wheelmen take on the problem of roads in the 1880s and 1890s and try and fix our terrible roads and, um, and actually have some success as I'll talk about later. Um, this was so popular that in the 1890s Burlington had 10 different retailers of bicycles. So this is with a population of 19, 20,000. And today we have 42, 43,000, and we have basically five retailers of bicycles. So half the population, double the number of bike shops. Really interesting, right? That this was such a craze, and everybody was getting in on this business. So uh, there was one dedicated bike shop, Lane's Bicycle Livery. If you were a visitor to Burlington in the 1890s, you could go there and you could rent a bicycle for a short term. Uh, if you rode to the o Howard Opera House, there was valet bicycle parking waiting for you in the 1890s. Um, but everyone was getting in on this. George Hager ran a hardware store. He sold harness trimmings. And he sold Victor and new male bicycles as well. And L.M. March, who was a jeweler dealing in diamonds, watches, clocks, jewelry, had optical goods and bicycles. And down here, E.H. Vancour, an electrician supply house, construction materials of every description had a bicycle department, right? So bicycles were really very exciting and people really understood that there was a mania associated with bicycles. This is a cartoon from 1897. Uh, bicycle, the latest disease, bicycle mania, we all have it. And it's really very fun to look at this up close because there was a moment in American history when bicycles were imagined as the future and cities were imagining reorganizing themselves for bicycle transportation systems and rural areas were starting to build pathways to each other so people could transport themselves with bicycles and everybody wanted to be in on this and so this kind of you know satirizes that bicycle complexion powders, bicycle jewelry, bicycle books uh, drink bicycle soda, <laughs> bicycle tonic, bike liniment. And, and so this is, this is fun. I'll get into this a little bit in my talk. Cures bicyclist diseases. Bicycle face cured. Bicycle face was a much feared disease and malady that was associated with bicycling that could be caused either by the struggle to hold a bicycle in balance and your face would get stuck in a contorted position <laughs> or because you were going fast all the time and your, fi your, your sort of face would get stuck as it's stuck back here and your eyes were popping out. Um, so, so, what's, so this was a mania, right? People were really obsessed with this and, uh, but you know, by 1905, certainly by 1910, this had more or less slowed down and bicycles really are no longer the locus of excitement. People are really shifting their attention and so the bike craze just dissipates. But here's the thing, it was not simply a fad. There's a lot that we take for granted today that was playing out in that decade and a half, two decades of the bicycle craze. So for example, and, and these are, the, they provoke enduring changes that 
you know, I'll give you one example, I'll give you several examples, but one that I find especially compelling as an anthropologist is that it created a certain kind of experience that people really wanted and loved. And that was the experience that we take for granted today of effortless speed. Right? You could just go kind of as fast as you could make your body go on a bicycle and you could point it in the direction you wanted to point it. And so people got fascinated with the idea of, the, of just going fast without much effort. Uh, they had trains, of course, but trains were thought to swallow you up. They, you didn't have what they thought of as automobility, right? The ability to just kind of move in any direction. And so, um, so people were obsessed with speed in the 1890s in particular. Bike racing was the NASCAR of the era. And uh, people, there were all kinds of speed records being broken constantly by people on bicycles. The um, bicycle also was tied to a very, very exciting and prestigious industry, uh, industrial development, and a lot of that was taking place south of us uh, in the Connecticut River Valley in uh, Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, Boston was another locus of a lot of bicycle manufacturing, Ch Chicopee Falls, which is in the Connecticut River Valley. Um, the, the bicycle is, is well known to have laid the technological and industrial groundwork for the automobile that emerges out of that. Uh, and uh, so for example, the ball bearing was sort of refined for the purposes of the bicycle, the bending of steel tubing. As soon as people could, beginning in the 1880s when internal combustion engines are uh, being developed, they're attaching them to bicycles. And so people are, are experimenting and tinkering and it eventually creates this incredible industry um, that in New England at least is based in the precision manufacturing of sewing machine factories that were converted to become bicycle factories. Uh, the Columbia Bicycle Factory, for example, was um, uh, cutting edge industrial practices. And so one of the interesting things um, that they did was they set up uh, an electrified um, uh, uh, assembly line. Uh, they were working 24-7. They basically hired Thomas Edison to come in and electrify their factory so that they could produce thousands upon thousands of bikes, bicycles 24-7. And imagine this, a young Henry Ford, who was a bicycle mechanic, went on a junket to Hartford and encountered this. He was blown away, it planted some seeds for him to think about when he, like many other bicycle, um, uh, bicycle uh, workers and owners, they eventually got into cars. And uh, so he took that, he was, his imagination was inspired by what he saw in that factory and he put a lot of it to work in the Ford Motor Factory. Um, there was uh, the legal groundwork, the traffic laws that were developed for bicycles were converted to automobiles. Um, there was also a reordering of gender relations as women are taking to the bicycle and asserting their autonomy, uh, they're asserting their political rights by using the bicycle. Um, their, um, uh, their bicycle is closely associated with the suffragist movement and the temperance movement because as it was said, you cannot ride home drunk on a bicycle. Um, so, um, and women in particular were really focused uh, initially on just changing their clothing and, and fighting for the right of, for, to exercise it with sort of freedom of bodily movement. Um, people were developing new ideas about recreation, how you should spend your leisure time using the bicycle. The bike was seen as an escape from dirty cities. So Vermont and New Hampshire became destinations for New York bicyclists and Boston bicyclists. So people were really pushing their physical limits on these things. At the same time, the bike really was um, causing all kinds of social disruption and commotion. You know, people, bicyclists are riding fast in city streets and threatening pedestrians and uh, bicycle laws have to be created. Religious leaders are seeing the decline of attendance at church on Sunday mornings as people would rather go for a bike ride. And uh, one, one Indiana pastor uh, thought, said, if you can't beat them, join them. And so he had ride-in bicycle services. <laughs> Um, but there was also a strong reaction from religious leaders. So um, Charlotte Smith, 
who was the president of the Women's Rescue League, was commenting on an, a, a bicycle ride that was being organized by a church. It was called the Bicycle Run for Christ. And so this is what she said. The bicycle run for Christ by so-called Christians should properly be, properly be termed the bicycle run for Satan. For the bicycle is the devil's advance agent, morally and physically, in thousands of instances. And health authorities are weighing in and saying that bicycles are causing all kinds of maladies and illnesses, not least of which is bicycle face, which was targeted at women. <laughs> Because it was said you would be ugly if you rode a bicycle and developed bicycle face, right? So there was an implicit threat there. So in this talk, I want to talk about Vermont's experience of all of this. And, I, you know, I ask questions like who was riding a bike and why were they riding bikes? You know, where would you buy bicycles in this period of the 1880s, 1890s? Uh, what was it like to ride on the roads around here? And, and uh, so I've organized this talk in three parts. One is the first part is on the wheelmen, these elite social networks that bring the bicycle to Vermont and create wheelmen's clubs. And then I'll talk about the new woman, the ways in which um, the ideas of the 1890s, the new woman emerging who's more autonomous and free, appro they appropriate the bicycle. Um, and then good roads. And Vermont occupies an interesting and important place in the politics of roads, uh, which I think you'll appreciate at the very end when I get to it. So the Wheelmen, here's the Bicycle Club of Swanton in 1893, uh, snappily dressed, posing with their bicycles. Uh, many of these individuals here were um, clerks. By the early 1890s, you see middle classes and aspirant middle classes beginning to get into bicycles. But before that, it was really a very elite object. As I said, the high wheels were, were expensive. And, um, you know, these people were joiners. They created a lot of fraternal organizations. And so when the bicycle first arrives, the, it's, a pro, it's thought to be appropriate that you ride a bicycle in a social group with peers. Uh, and, and it was men, right? So because it takes... Um, a lot of uh, time and athleticism, uh, they, they called it athleticism, to be able to ride these things, practice, right? Um, and so the early wheelmen in Vermont in the 1880s were largely, you know, lawyers, doctors, publishers of the newspapers, and so on. And by far the most influential wheel club, wheelmen's club, we had in Vermont was in Brattleboro, the Vermont Wheel Club. It was the second longest running wheel club in the United States and one of the very first that was founded um, in this country. And part of it is Brattleboro was tied to, you know, it's in the Connecticut River Valley, very close to, you know, Massachusetts and, and Hartford, Connecticut, where you see the manufacturing beginning to emerge. So all of these sort of business ties, you see bicycles immediately come in through Brattleboro. And the, Brattle, the Vermont Wheel Club establishes itself. You didn't even need to have a bicycle to join. You just had to be an upstanding male citizen. Um, and they built an incredible um, uh, uh, facility which had uh, visiting guest rooms so wheelmen who were riding through could stop and spend the night and be feted in a large banquet hall that had their, their famous symbol, the winged wheel symbol, on all of the um, silverware and the plates. Um, and. Uh, so this was uh, sort of a very important organization for Brattleboro. They sponsored a baseball team. They, um, you know, they were, they had field days events. They had a great racing team that was known throughout the East Coast as a really competitive team. But everyone in the rest of Vermont also knew that something big was happening there and the elites of Brattleboro were involved with bicycles. So if you were wanting to go for some state office at that time, you would make it down to their winter ball and glad hand because this was Southern Vermont's most influential people. In Burlington, we had a wheel club the Burlington Wheel Club in 1886, standing there in front of the Fletcher Free Library. And um, what's so interesting is about this, is this didn't last long. This club was there for about a year and a half. Because in 1887, 
the Lake Champlain Yacht Club was founded. And so all of these guys sold their bicycles and bought yachts, <laughs> right? So they wanted, so what was the most prestigious object you could get at the time, right? <laughs> Apparently the yacht outshines the bicycle, but um, in, in other parts of Vermont, the bicycle remains a very important prestige object. Here's an early wheelman. This is Joseph Ald, who was the president. He was in that photo of that Burlington Club in 1886. He also bought a yacht in 1887. Um, but here he is. Um, he wrote a book called Picturesque Burlington, which is in 1893, which is a beautiful little book of, of, of landscapes and getting to know the countryside around Burlington. And it, it, if you read it, it mentions bicycles maybe once, but it's very much a wheelman's sensibilities because it promotes landscape appreciation. There was this sort of prestige that was accruing to people who could look at nature and mountains and lakes in new ways. So not surprisingly, the early cyclists were also getting cameras and they were doing a lot of sketching. Uh, and you, you, so they often called themselves land seers. This idea that they could sort of see the land with new eyes by using their bicycles. And you see that sensibility in picturesque Burlington. The other thing is that these early wheelmen were tinkerers. And so Joseph Ald was tinkering with um, gearing systems in the 1880s. In 1883, he filed for a patent for a tricycle gearing system. So kind of, you know, people who, uh, you know, were educated, were very interested in the technology. They were seeing the technology as a really progressive phenomenon. Um, in Rutland, uh, they formed one of the early uh, clubs here in Vermont too, the Rutland Bicycle Club. That guy, that first image I showed uh, earlier of the high wheel, that was Nellie Ross. He was the captain. Uh, his father was the president of the Lincoln Iron Works, and he eventually became manager of that. Um, so he's in this club. These guys had an, a, a great aspiration to build a skating rink uh, so that they could practice their tricks and ride year-round in the winters. And in fact, there was an interesting association between early bicycles and skating rinks. So roller skating rinks in particular, roller skating was just taking off. And uh, wheelmen would sometimes buy a skating rink. But these guys, they built one. And uh, it was quite a spectacle. It was considered to be one of the finest skating rinks in New England. It opened in July 4th in 1884. They had a fantastic opening event. And uh, it cost them $15,000 to make, uh, which in today's money is about $430,000. There were 1,200 seats in this facility, um, 800 on the bottom, 400 up top. They had gas jets, chandeliers. But here's the, this was the great mystery. I saw some tidbit somewhere at some point that the next year in 1885, the thing sold at auction for $2,325. This was a mystery. I was like, how the heck did that happen? You know, there's a huge investment. And so I doggedly tracked down this story. Like there's like two people in Vermont who really care, but I'm one of them. <laughs> and I tracked down this story. It turns out that when these young guys went to the, uh, uh, they got a bank loan uh, to pay for all this. You know, they were wealthy, but not that wealthy, right? So they got a bank loan and the clerk in the city of Rutland offices um, wrote the collateral incorrectly. Well, they were putting in a cutting edge heating system in the basement and the company that was putting in the heating system caught wind that there were some problems at the clerk's office. They sent one of their agents. It turns out, yes, that this is all messed up. And so basically the heating company puts a lien on the whole thing. And so these poor guys are like, oh, I guess, well, we'll just put it up for auction. So. This was their last hurrah. In 1885, they rode down to Springfield, Massachusetts, and then they called it quits. They disbanded as a club and they said, forget this, we're not gonna do this bicycle thing anymore. Um, 
uh, the Mount Kilburn Wheel Club uh, down there in Bellows Falls. Their president was a lawyer. And uh, lawyers um, would love to um, uh, put on mock trials. And so wheelmen's clubs were more than just bicycling, right? They, were, they would have, you know, in this case, they had ladies' nights. Um, and they would put on mock trials. This describes, from 1894, a trial that they put on uh, for the larceny of a Plymouth Rock rooster. And they wanted to demonstrate how a trial works. And as they said, aside from the rare fun of the occasion, the entertainment will be exceedingly interesting to ladies and others who have never attended a real trial. So, uh, they, you know, this was the heart of social life in Bellows Falls, was, you know, to, to go to their, their ladies' nights and go to their concerts and balls and all of that. In the Upper Valley, there was another real focus of excitement. Um, in 1895, there was an enormous parade in Woodstock. And um, here's a picture of it. Uh, and I'm going to read this to you. This is the newspaper article about it. But you could get as many as 500 wheelmen show up in Woodstock to, do, to go on a parade. Um, that's what wheelmen did. They loved parading about. Um, and so this describes that parade that took place here. A bicycle meet and parade under the auspices of the Wabino Cycle Club was held at Woodstock last Friday afternoon and evening and was a brilliant and successful affair. Stores and residences were elaborately decorated and in the evening the entire village was beautifully illuminated by over 3,000 Japanese lanterns. You can actually make them out in the background. The Hartford and Lebanon cycle clubs and cyclists from adjoining towns were present. The Woodstock Railway Company running a special tram. About 200 wheels were in line and the parade was witnessed by several thousand people. There was a fine display of fireworks in the evening. Woodstock Cornet Band, discoursed music and refreshments were served to all cyclists and visiting friends in the town hall. So a bicycle parade turns out thousands of people Right? It becomes the center of, you know, community life. And there's an interesting sort of footnote in here, this sort of Woodstock Railway thing. They ran a special tram. So the way you got around as a wheelman was you would get your bike on the train to go visit your friends at other cities or go to a parade. Some people would ride, but the roads were terrible, so you would get on a train. And um, one of the big political pushes for wheelmen, remember these are influential men, was to get permission to bring their bicycles on for free on the trains. They took it up with the state legislature, the Senate denied it, but the railway companies were smart. They said, nope, you can bring your bicycles on the train. So they were, they were actively lobbying the train companies. Now. Some of you who are cyclists know that we fought long and hard to get our bicycles on the Amtrak, which we recently successfully achieved. Um, so they had already done this, right? They had already figured out that, you know, the trains would be advantageous to bicycles. Here's another fun little element of the Woodstock story. Um, uh, I ran across this photo, uh, someone gave it to me, I didn't think much of it until I saw that. So this is the home of a, a guy who owned a pharmacy in Woodstock in 1900. And in the background you see this crazy bicycle. And that bicycle was called a Star Rider. And it was the Mercedes of bicycles of its day. It was. Um, a very innovative bicycle that was a transition between that high wheeler and the safety. And so this bicycle was in around 1884, 85, 86. And um, it, there, so it's the bigger wheel is in the rear, smaller wheel up front. And it had a, a tr sort of a treadle system. So it weren't spinning pedals, you were just sort of pumping. And this has an interesting connection to Woodstock. So the Star Rider, this was the first bicycle, by the way, that rode down Mount Washington in 1884. A guy, a nutcase named Hazlitt, <laughs> rode it down. But here, here's John Stout, who was riding down the Michigan State Capitol steps. He was like the Tiger Woods of that era. 
uh, on a bicycle. And uh, I mean, that's incredible, really. But this was such a popular bicycle that there was a song uh, that was created. Um, I haven't found the music, but I found the cover. Um, but anyway, this bicycle was manufactured by H.B. Smith Machine Company. So that's the Vermont Woodstock connection. So H.B. Smith was a young guy born and raised in Woodstock, Vermont, and he got into the manufacture of woodworking equipment, precision woodworking equipment. And he, he was very, very successful. <clears throat> and his ambitions transcended what he could do in Vermont. And so he moved to New Jersey and he bought a township. Um, and he created a factory there where he could just have enormous scale of creating this fine precision woodworking equipment. And then one day a guy shows up who has plans and a vision of this star rider. And the guy says, you have the kind of precision manufacturing equipment that I need to make this bicycle. Would you go into business with me? And so H.B. Smith, you know, being a, a savvy business guy, sees the opportunity. He wasn't a bicyclist himself, but he knew there was a great opportunity here. And they made a ton of money on these bicycles. H.B. Smith eventually bailed on the bicycle business and really focused down. But anyway, there's our Vermont connection to a very famous bicycle. Enthusiasm in the Northeast Kingdom is especially high for bicycles. The Fairbanks um, uh, company made a bicycle beam, a precision bicycle beam for weighing bicycles. They were at shops all over. Um, the top bike shop for sales in the 1890s it was in Lindenville, interestingly. Um, and in St. Johnsbury in Linden, a group of wheelmen came together to create a bike path between the towns. And that was a really interesting moment because that was happening all over the sort of upper Midwest, New York State, this sort of, you know, parts of the country that were bike crazy were starting to build bike highways between towns. Um, in Vermont, our ever conservative Senate denied that as a, something that the state would support. But these folks did um, up in St. Jay and Linden. Down the road in Morrisville, they were selling this really funky bicycle in 1902, the Knowles Spring Frame. Morrisville was, um, had its own bicycle craze. Uh, this was Wheelman's Day, June 2nd, 1895. On the other side is this sumptuous meal at this hotel. Um, the, the hotels really tried to attract the wheelmen to come in. Uh, and, uh, and of course, Hardwick had its own bicycle craze. Um, uh, Ira Shattuck was really the one who brought this in. He was a very central figure in this town, town clerk, uh, eventually became postmaster, uh, Republican committeeman, and also a business owner. Uh, he, he owned a, a jewelry store and uh, also they, he manufactured watches there. And so I like his ad here, the Sterling, built like a watch, right? He's, he's selling uh, bicycles using the metaphors that he knows, right? Um, but um, uh, he was a very influential figure, as you'll see in a sec. Uh, but he did have competition. CM Warner over in East Hardwick was selling some very fine bicycles, and he listed how many he sold every season. He wanted you to know that that was the place to go because he sold, he'd tell you exactly how many he sold. And uh, as, it said, as it said in the Hardwick Gazette in 1898, with the number of wheelmen Hardwick possesses, it should not be without a large and well-regulated bicycle club the following season. Or, and so, or the coming season. And so where was that bike, bicycle club? It never seemed to form. This is a new mystery for me. <laughs> And I don't know why, because wheelmen's clubs were really common. I'm starting to think that maybe it was because Hardwick was a little bit a step behind the, the times. So the peak was 1896. And here in 1898, <laughs> they're saying, hey, let's organize a bike club. Let's all sell bicycles. And, and of course, this was a time when Hardwick was undergoing a lot of transformation, right? The beginnings of the... Uh, building granite industry are really taking off. You see a lot of immigration into the town, workers coming in, there's increasing class stratification. Uh, uh, but the bicycle 
is um, a key part of these sort of changes because, you know, Ira Shattuck in particular is a key figure and he organizes to create the Prospect Park, which is a racetrack, and they also had baseball fields. And um, what really takes over here in Hardwick, maybe more so than many other towns that I've looked at, is bicycle racing. People were really obsessed with bicycle racing here. Um, including uh, Ed Apple, who uh, he was initially, probably when this picture was taken, uh, he was a foreman at the Hard Hardwick Gazette, but by 1911 or so, he is the publisher of the Hardwick Gazette. Um, and uh, so bicycle racing was a big thing, and um, you can imagine the, the, there was always prizes that went along with this, um, and Ira Shattuck was always the organizer because it was at his Prospect Park. So the number one prize, this is another unique thing I saw, the number one prize was always a watch <laughs> <laughs> or some kind of piece of jewelry. Interestingly, in other places like Burlington, you would get a camera, right, which was a real prestige object back then. Uh, and, then you, and then the lower levels would get bicycle tires or something like that. So Wheelman promoted racing. Um, oh, and let me just back up because it's important to recognize that the, the speed, that obsession with speed was so great that, um, that we kind of can be snooty about our own speed on bicycles, you know, with our carbon fiber and our aerodynamic and so on. But I've, I've, I've studied many races that have happened. And a lot of the races were around a track like you had at Prospect Park. But other races were just on the countryside. They would follow a road and they would be a 40 mile race or a 25 mile race. And what's most astonishing is that the typical bike race was averaging about 20 miles an hour. Averaging 20 miles an hour. Now these are bicycles that are largely single gear, right? They, 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 some, most of them were fixed gears. Some, you know, there were such things as free wheels, but they weren't very common. So you, people were riding really, really fast and they were in, incredibly accomplished athletes, right? So if you're averaging 20 miles per hour on roads around here today, you're doing pretty well. But imagine those roads being terrible on a single speed bicycle with no gears. So. Um, they also celebrated feats of endurance. They're really pushing their bodies in all kinds of ways. And this is a little tidbit from the Herald and News from Wes Randolph from 1894, describing two crack Woodstock wheelmen, Irving Ransom and Max Mass, started Sunday morning at 2.30 and rode to Littleton, New Hampshire, a distance of 83 miles. So they, they just head out for a, you know, a bike ride. 83 miles later, they're in Littleton, New Hampshire. Their plan was to stop there and turn back and head back to Woodstock, but they decided to keep on going. They went to Woodsville, they stopped in St. Johnsbury, and then after 158 miles in 23 hours, they took a short rest, <laughs> and then another, rode another 52 miles home. This is newsworthy, right? This is important news in the state of Vermont, and not just Vermont, in other states as well. As people are pushing, you know, that bike to do things and their bodies to do things they've never in experienced before. The other thing that Wheelman promoted was orderly riding. Now remember, riding a bicycle was thought to be most appropriately done with your peers in formation. Um, and so there's a lot of pressure uh, among wheelmen to, to normalize that style of riding. Um, but the newspapers were full of um, advice and, and, you know, talking about these norms. So the Burlington Free Press in 1895 advises us, always keep to the right, always keep your wheel clean. In passing another rider or vehicle, keep to the right. Keep off crowded streets unless you have urgent business there. Don't forget that pedestrians have rights. It often saves bitter thoughts. <laughs> And then this is a really fascinating thing. So as I said, people are figuring out the norms of bicycling. And this was a tidbit from the United Opinion of Bradford, 1895, called Cycling Etiquette, and I'll read it. Every sport has its rules of etiquette and a system of exchange of courtesies must be adapted to cycling conditions. 
A question that is causing a great deal of agitation relates to the mode of greeting among wheel men and wheel women. Shall a man take his hand from the handlebar at the risk of taking a header in order to tip his cap? Or shall he merely nod his head and say howdy? <laughs> shall a lady make a sweeping courtesy or merely nod? Instances are cited wherein men have tried to do that which they have been taught from childhood and the result has been a hectic flush all over one side of their faces where the skin was caressed by the loving but somewhat calloused hand of Mother Earth. <laughs> Ladies who have bowed too profoundly have been picked up tenderly by helping hands after it was all over. It is with reason, therefore, that cyclists are giving this matter serious consideration. So people are working it out. They're trying to figure out, you know, how do we interact with each other with this fast moving thing? And, you know, do you, uh, you know, what kind of etiquette and, and uh, rules of the road are going to exist? But here's the thing, lurking out there is this thing called scorching and the scorcher. And the scorcher is uh, causing havoc and our newspapers are full of this moral panic of the scorcher. Now the scorcher, interestingly enough, is often a working class young man who doesn't have the sort of cultural capital uh, uh, or the financial capital to join a wheelman's club, right? So, so these, but these guys want to be part of it too, right? So they're riding their bicycles and they became associated with what was called furious riding. <laughs> which was riding really fast and, uh, and not respecting the laws and the rules and the orderly uh, composition of the typical wheelman's ride. But this article from 1899 captures the kind of feel of that moral panic and the kind of the exhaustion with it because it starts this with this. Another accident occurred Tuesday evening as a direct result of the ever-present bicycle scorcher. And it happened right in front of this bicycle shop. This is Lane's Cycle Livery on Loomis Street in Burlington. It's now a student house. <laughs> Bunch of students live there, but it was a magnificent bike dealer back then. And what the mechanic, a guy named Abner Lozo, was scorching down Loomis Street. Maybe he had fixed a bike, who knows, and he wanted to test it out. And he ran, ran over Barney Buxton, a boy of eight or nine years old. He lay unconscious, cut on one side of his head, his right arm seriously brood, bruised. They called Dr. Lyman. The boy eventually regains consciousness, can't remember a thing. But this kind of story is common in our newspapers and even in small towns. And there was, as early as eight, early 18, uh, let's say 1893, 94, towns are starting to ban sidewalk, sidewalk riding. Um, and try and keep people from, you know, they're putting in um, speed limits and so on. But Abner Lozo, um, <laughs> it was funny, I, 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 I've tried to figure out Abner Lozo and I've tried to figure out Barney Buxton, who are these, these guys. Um, can't find much, right? But one day I got an email from someone, it's like, Professor Vivanco, um, my great-great-grandfather was a guy named Abner Lozo, and I hear you're, the, you're a historian in Burlington. What do you know about him? I was like, oh, he ran over a boy named Barney Buxton. <laughs> he was a scorcher, right? <laughs> so wheelmen's organizations tried to get ahead of all this, right? And what they proposed was regulation. And so, um, as, as I mentioned earlier, the Bellows Falls Club, the Mount Kilburn Wheel Club, their, their, uh, the head of their club was a lawyer. So he was very active in writing laws and proposing laws. And so he wrote this in the Bellows Falls Times in 1897. Uh, uh, this idea of regulating bicycle riding. There has been considerable complaint of fast and reckless riding. It is better that the wheelmen take the matter in hand themselves. And eventually he decide, they decide that all wheelmen should carry lanterns and bells and keep to the right side of the street or on such bicycle paths as may hereafter be provided. So 1897-1898 is the year that all Vermont towns or most Vermont towns decide that it's time to put regulations and ordinances on bicycling. 
And what's so interesting about it is they're very similar to the ones we have today. So in Burlington, for example, in 1897, the ordinance calls for uh, lights on your bicycle at night. There was very brisk business in bicycle accessories, so it was very easy to get an oil lamp. It calls for bells. It has a speed limit of five miles per hour in the downtown core and no sidewalk riding in the inner fire district, which is the downtown core, right? We have more or less the same set of restrictions minus the speed limit, right? So, you know, UVM students bomb down Pearl Street like they did in the 1890s. Um, and there are articles about that too. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, so the idea was, you know, the towns are beginning to respond and um, they invent traffic laws, uh, which eventually the automobile sort of falls into and then supplants and then it becomes its own realm of law. But the, that idea that you needed to regulate traffic in that way came about because of cyclists. Now what about the new woman? Part two. This is from the Londonderry Sifter in 1897. This is a cartoon. He, don't you think it rather risky to come so far alone on your wheel? She, hadn't thought of it, but if you feel timid, I'll see you home. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, as I said earlier, the, the bicycle is really popular among certain women who are appropriating it to, you know, get out in public space in new ways and they're challenging the idea that you need to have a chaperone because they're going out together in groups of two or three on bicycles. Uh, they're riding with men. Um, they're, you know, changing their attire so that they can feel more free and so the bloomer is, is a, a, a a, a ill-disguised uh, set of pants that look like a dress, right? Uh, but, uh, but bloomers were extremely um, popular but also controversial. Um, and there was a town in the Northeast Kingdom, I forget which one, but uh, where um, there was a, um, a visiting preacher who was uh, lambasting the women with bloomers in the town and saying that it was leading to, you know, the decline of civilization with these women and their bloomers. And this was reported on um, by another Northeast Kingdom town, I can't remember which, that said, if that preacher came to this town, he would have been killed. <laughs> because we take bloomers seriously here. So, you know, people were, you know, women were, were really asserting their, their, their sense of uh, a new future with the bicycle. And, uh, it, and not surprisingly, suffragists really latched onto this. So Elizabeth Cady Stanton wrote, the bicycle will inspire women with more courage, self-respect, and self-reliance, and will make the next generation more vigorous of mind and body. For feeble mothers do not produce great statesmen, scientists, and scholars. So the newspapers here in Vermont are full of you know, references and conversations about the woman and the wheel. The coming woman will be the woman whose mother rode a bicycle and thereby made herself fit to be the mother of the coming woman, says Ida Trafford Bell. There are eight million bachelors in the United States. Watch their reduction in number as soon as the bicycle girl in bloomers is scattered over the land, <laughs> says the American wheelman. <laughs> so, uh, there's a lot of conversation, as I say, and, and again, it circulates in some cases around the norms and the norms around women, you know, becoming um, engaged with uh, men outside their families in new ways. And this is an interesting and fun one called Selecting a Cycle Teacher that also, this was also in the free press in 1895. Most cycle depots will send up a man to teach any of their own customers, and many ladies have learned in this fashion. Personally, however, it seems to me that if one must clutch any male thing wildly by the neck and fall into his arms 10 or 20 times in the course of an afternoon, a relative or intimate friend is better than an unknown oily mechanic. <laughs> and I should therefore counsel any girl who contemplates learning the safety to select her teacher with these unavoidable contingencies in full view. So, 
1892, there was a, a well-known conference that happened in Montpelier on the right of suffrage and the complete enfranchisement of women. Uh, as many of you know, suffrage in Vermont didn't happen until it was passed nationally, and it had a really steep hill to climb here. There was a lot of resistance in Vermont to women's suffrage. And so interestingly, this, um, this conference, there was very little talk about the right to vote. And it was about other things. And one of the addresses was on physical training for women. And so this was one of the ways in which you could see suffragists in Vermont were talking about you know, women's rights was more their right to uh, an exercising body, the right to healthful activity, the right to what they called hygiene, which was this sort of sanitary living ideal. And um, this address didn't refer to bicycles once, um, but it is constantly referring to women's, the importance of women having the ability to get out and to move their bodies. Um, and uh, so interestingly, the um, uh, the the, com the complex there was a complexity in Vermont around the association between suffrage and the bicycle. This is from uh, the Orleans County Monitor. Miss May June, do you believe in woman suffrage? Miss Jan Feb, well, er, I haven't quite come to that yet, but I ride a bicycle. All right, so people were women were making a separation in some cases here. Um, uh, uh, Wiz shared with me this image of ladies writing down South Main Street, Hardwick. We don't know who they are. $50 if you can figure that out. Um, but here's the Wells, the Wells women. Uh, the, this, um, she was married to uh, 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 General William Wells, the, one of the heroes of Gettysburg. Uh, and they owned the Wells Richardson Corporation, which was um, man, a global manufacturer of um, Payne celery compound, which was used to treat everything from heart attacks to, you know, a stubbed toe. Um, the FDA basically, when it came about, shut it down. Or, you know, the, the Food Safety Acts. But um, anyway, they were conservative women, right? They were not suffragists, but they were out there on their bicycles. Um, I don't have any good answers as to why suffragists in Vermont didn't closely associate themselves with the bicycle in ways that Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony and others did. Um, there's some theories, um, you know, one is that women were gaining in economic power at that time as they are, uh, especially in rural communities, as tourists are coming and it's the women who are interacting with the tourists, collecting the money, putting them up for the stay, feeding them and so on. Uh, there was this idea that Vermont was already a bastion of American democracy and so women did have, in beginning in 1872, certain municipal rights of suffrage where they could vote in school board elections and things like that. Um, and uh, uh, there was a very strong um, idea in Vermont that the, that the public sphere was a male sphere and the private sphere was a women's sphere. And so, uh, you know, it, it, su suffrage as a, as a political effort really, you know, as I said, struggled to gain steam. And I think it was the suffragists in Vermont didn't want to associate with the bicycle too carefully because it itself was controversial. People were fighting over the bicycle and they didn't see that maybe it was politically advantageous to associate with the bicycle. There was also a lot of health concerns targeted at women uh, about their use of bicycles. And a huge health debate played out in the 1890s, <clears throat> the best RX is a ride, take it instead of going to the druggist. This is, so this is one side of that debate. Um, and there was this, this idea of bicycling hygiene um, being promoted, it opens up the pores which should be treated with ablutions of water. You should know how to breathe because breathing through the mouth can cause heart troubles. And be sure your mouth doesn't get parched, it can affect digestion. Drink milk with a few drops of rum in it before a ride. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, so this was the, how you would ride a bike, how you would prepare to ride a bike. Um, and uh, uh, this is incredibly common advice. I see it all over. Um, and, and interestingly, there was, um, 
I didn't know, I, a lot of this stuff was coming from outside of Vermont, but about two years ago I discovered that there was a, a professor of nervous disorders named Graham Hammond at UVM uh, who, who studied bicycling and wrote a book about the positive benefits of bicycling, especially for women. Uh, his, his sort of conclusion is something like, you know, in moderation the bicycle is a wonderful thing for people's bodies. So, uh, so apparently at UVM we've been studying this for over a hundred years. Um, and, and then this is a really remarkable screed against bicycles, the other side of it. Uh, it's uh, quoting a guy named Heine Mark, Dr. Heine Marks, who was the superintendent of a hospital in St. Louis. And he's talking about how bad bicycle riding is. And he says, first you have a kind of paralysis of the hands. They call that bicycle hands, by the way. Um, we still have it, right? You get numb hands. Uh, and contraction of the chest. This causes congestion of the lungs and leads to consumption. I just want to pause there and say that consumption is tuberculosis. So we're working with that. Furthermore, with men, rupture, varicocele, hydrocele follow, and worst of all, it destroys virility. With women, writing promotes amorous desires. Married women are especially liable to very serious mishaps including the displacement of the womb. That was a big concern. Um, if the world is not depopulated by the rapidly increasing membership of this suicide club, the human race will die out by reason of lack of manhood and inability to propagate. <laughs> so there are all kinds of named bicycle concerns and diseases. And again, as I said, some are targeted at women. Besides bicycle face, there was a thing called bicycle feet. And um, there was, uh, the, <laughs> this would happen to women who wore fashionable French boots. And what would happen was their arches would collapse <laughs> if they rode a bike in these French boots. Um, there was a thing called kyphosis bicyclistarum, which was typical of scorchers. And it was this sort of hunchback position that you would be locked in and walk around like this. <laughs> so, so yeah, big, big debate, and, and, and uh, that health debate really did occupy the headlines um, in our newspapers. It was lots of concerns about that. But in the end, most Vermonters who were riding bikes felt, fell in line with Graham Hammond. They said, yeah, that's, <laughs> in moderation, this is a good thing. Now what about the roads? Part three. Well, as you can see, they were in terrible shape. So... Um, you know, these were influential people in the early years um, of bicycle riding, and they confronted this common problem that they were very annoyed with, which was that the roads were really bad. And um, it has a lot to do with how we managed roads uh, up until really the early 20th century. Um, but wheelmen were the first to sort of take on this as a problem and be pretty successful at it. Um, so in 1880, there was a, a meetup of wheelmen in Newport, Rhode Island. And at that event was, an, a, an organization was founded called the League of American Wheelmen. Now that organization still exists. It's called the League of American Bicyclists. It's the sort of the prominent primary bike advocacy group in our country. Um, what they did, though, was so interesting, is they, they create this wheelman's organization to fight for the rights of wheelmen who are being banned from city parks, and, and everyone is in agreement that they got to deal with the road problem. So they create a sister organization called the League of Good Roads. And, that, and the bicycle industry funds the League of Good Roads and the Good Roads movement. And they, they train the wheelmen all throughout the United States in their talking points. Um, to go to their local officials and talk up how we're going to change the road system. So the way we dealt with roads was, you know, here's a typical Green Mountain Road. Um, that farmer was likely going to be in charge of that segment of road that was proximal to his property. And as a result, you would, he would throw stones out there as he's clearing fields. They would eventually get crushed down. Um, but by the 1890s, we had 13,000 miles of um, terribly rutted roads that were 
not built with any kind of anything other than local talent <laughs> um, and local effort. And so one of the ways you paid your taxes in Vermont for a long time was by working on the road. Um, and the towns more or less controlled uh, uh, or dictated what would happen to the roads in the town boundaries. Uh, that doesn't mean that they worked on all the roads. Typically it was the neighbors that would. Um, but it, was, it meant that we had several hundred towns that each had different approaches to roads um, or neglect of roads. So um, <clears throat> how did Wheelman know what was a good place to ride? Well, they shared intel. And one of the things that um, they did was they would write to each other about good rides they'd taken and provide advice. And this is a really novel way that, one way that this occurred. It was called 10,000 Miles on a Bicycle. It was published in 1887. And it was a, a, a guy named Carl Crump. Well, his real name was Lyman Bag, um, But he had, for some reason, he needed a pen name. And it was Carl Crone. And he rode. Uh, all throughout New England and the upper Midwest and into Canada. And he had this really novel way to fund his bike ride, which was he would take notes from local wheelmen about the good rides. And then he, he, they, be, they would give him each $5. And he said, I will send you the book when I'm done. And then you'll know all the great rides that you can go on because all the wheelmen are going to pitch in and share all, their, all the details. So he was in Vermont. And about 13 of our wheelmen bought this. They were subscribers. It's kind of a who's who. This book is like 900 pages. Because it's like, it's a who's who of 1880s like wheelmen in the United States. And as I said, there was like 13 Vermonters who bought this. And he describes, what, this is just one section where he describes his riding in Vermont. So if you ever are playing Vermont Trivial Pursuit and someone asks, when was the first century ride in Vermont? The answer is right here. The longest day's ride previously taken in Vermont was on July 9th, 83, 1883, by two Rutland boys, W. Eggleston and N.S. Marshall, 100 and a half miles. So they were on high wheels because that's what was then. That was the bike that was in the one you used then. And they rode 100 miles, which was an incredible feat, really. But you know, there's, there's just kind of mundane details. He's talking about the roads as fair and you know, sat patches of sand here and there. Some stretches are unrideable. Later, there was a thing called the Vermont Road Book, which was a, sort of like a triptych. You remember the AAA would have triptychs, you know, that they did that back in the 1890s. Um, and you would go on a sort of curated ride. It would tell you where to turn and all that. So they would share intel to avoid the bad roads. Um, and the bicycle industry is feverishly supporting a good roads movement. Um, and Albert Pope, who was the founder of uh, Pope Manufacturing, they made Columbia bicycles. I'm sure somebody here has had a Columbia. Um, pro very, probably the most prominent bike company at the time. Um, he would go around the country and talk about highway improvement. An eminent right, and this is sort of, it's so interesting to sort of see how they thought of this. An eminent writer says, the road is that physical sign or symbol by which you will best understand any age or people. If they have no roads, they are savages, for the road is the creation of man and the type of civilized society. There are so many ways, like as an anthropologist, I'm just fascinated because there are so many times I, I just see somebody saying, the Incas have better roads than we do, you know? It's <laughs> like they were smarter than us. What's wrong with us? And so the Pope Manufacturing Company ha would hold essay competitions. Here's a one that they had um, in 1892. And so uh, they invited uh, boys and young men in high school and prep schools and academies and colleges to write essays on the subject of good roads. And they were giving away 100 uh, Columbia bicycles. And so the Pope Manufacturing Company had a road department. So really, this close association between this political movement and the industry. Um, and uh, wheelmen were creative. They loved to parade. And so they would do protest rides. And here's, uh, this is the Good Roads Frog, um, who was riding, who was known to ride around Vermont and northern New York. This is a trip to Osable Chasm. Uh, and there he is standing at the bottom. 
but you know, I think of like, we do Halloween, Halloween rides today and things like that as a way that they're never, they're never politically innocent. There's always this sense of when you have children on the roads and you're claiming the roads, you got the police escort. It's, it's a statement that says the roads are ours too, right? And they were doing that very in your face as well. They were getting out there and saying, we need to rethink roads. So what happens? Well, all of that agitation to improve roads um, begins to, uh, in the early, late 1880s, early 1890s, begin to really start changing politicians' minds about the road problem. And um, in 1892, Vermont is one of the first states in the country to pass a highway law that fundamentally transforms how this country deals with roads. So they centralize control. It's like, hey towns, you've had 200 years to do this and it's pretty much sucked, right? So the state is gonna take over. Now this was politically fraught. The towns in Vermont have incredible power, right? So th this took a while for it to kind of eventually work its way out where the towns were okay with this. Um, but there was also new property taxes were being collected um, and then distributed as aid back to the towns and then towns could issue bonds. So this was a phenomenon called state aid. Now we take that for granted today, but it was invented by wheelmen as a way to create funds so that the government could take over and then distribute money to improve roads. And they created a state highway commission. So the governor at the time who signed this legislation was Levi Fuller. And I think it's so interesting to know where he's from. He's from Brattleboro. So think back to the Vermont Wheel Club, one of the most influential clubs in Southern Vermont. His brother-in-law was the president of that wheel club. Now, Fuller was not a wheelman himself, but he was being harassed and cajoled and, and his ear was being bent constantly on the road issue by his friends, by his peers. So he became quite famous nationally and he traveled the country giving addresses on the road Problem. He was known as the road governor. So Vermont was one of six states to do this um, in the early 1890s. Uh, Massachusetts and New Jersey went the farthest. We never gave up complete um, control to the towns, but they did. They took it from their towns completely. And then 1900 rolls around and we see the emergence of a new vehicle. Um, you know, the first car to climb Mount Washington was in 1899. Vermont Motor Company established in 1902. Horatio Nelson Jackson makes a famous bet to drive across country. Do you all know about that famous bet? It's a great story. Horatio Nelson Jackson was a Burlington physician, young guy, um, married into the Wells family. And uh, <clears throat> he was tired of being a physician. He was kind of lost his focus. And so he goes out to San Francisco and he's drinking beer and playing cards one night in 1903 and he says to his buddies, I bet you I could drive a car across this country. And they're like, oh, no way. And so they bet $50 and the next day he goes out and he buys a little red car and he has a dog with him. And he drives across the country, the first person to drive a car. And of course there were no real roads either back then. So it was quite an adventure. Um, his car is in the Smithsonian, you could have an exhibit about it. Um, but uh, that's Vermont's role in, a, in the history of the automobile. Um, and then those same gentlemen who were on bicycles or yachts get the first cars, right? Um, there were stories about locomobiles that were steam powered as early as the 1890, around 1890, 91. And in 1902, Burlington's Fourth of July celebration parade which was for a decade and a half led by the wheelmen, right? Suddenly, it's, you've got automobiles in that, right? So this was the first sort of parade in Vermont uh, with cars in it. What's the horribles? Oh, horribles are a fantastic phenomenon. So horribles are um, individuals who would be at parades dressed in a very mocking way of political leaders. <laughs> And they were like clowns. They would make fun of the political class. I think we need horribles back, by the way. Um, yeah, 
actually, I worked in, in southern Mexico in Oaxaca for about seven or eight years in a Zapotec community, and they have horribles of their own. They have these ritual clowns who have complete immunity to make fun of the leaders of that town, and otherwise you can't. Right, and that, so horribles were invented in Massachusetts and they spread up here into Vermont. The last horribles, I think, were in the 1950s, maybe. But I think we need to bring them back. I think they're on the line now. <laughs> <laughs> and then after 1910, the newspapers are about this. The, the stories that were once so breathless about the excitement and the arrival of the bicycle and bike dealers sponsoring bike races and so on, they're just replaced by stories that we now know very well, that bikes versus cars thing. And while in 1920, there were only 33,000 cars in Vermont that were registered, and many, many, many more bicycles, um, you have the, the car increasingly pushing the bicycle to the margins. It's not really thought of as a transportation thing. It's increasingly seen as a child's toy. And um, so that conflict is one that we've had here for a long time. And that's the end of my talk. <laughs>
right, where e-bikes are very expensive. And so the people in the 1890s who would have been joining wheel clubs, they're, our version of that today is let's get e-bikes, right? Um, and so e-bikes, though, are a disruptive technology. And I do feel like, you know, this is a great moment for an anthropologist, like, a new technology emerges and you can sort of see people debating over what are we going to do about this, right? And um, in Burlington, you know, there's stark debates about e-bikes and about e-scooters, like we banned e-scooters because they were just sort of too unpredictable and um, uh, but yeah, people's ideas about the roads come into stark um, evidence when you you see something like the e-bike show up right B you know we built roads for cars you know, we re we re re rebuilt them for cars right they weren't built for cars originally um, but and we gave them decades and decades of you know just this is yours right and so um, the the e-bike strikes me as um, uh, disruptive in ways that even e-bike riders don't know necessarily the power that they have to be unpredictable to you know um, you know and we don't train people to ride bikes in cities right the Dutch do when you're in middle school in Holland you take a bicycle riding class so you know I think our, 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 our we're just gonna see more and more e-bikes come out they're the fastest selling, growing sector of the bicycle industry. China is awash in e-bikes, right? We, we, we Americans tend to fixate on the story of China being a story of them getting cars. No, they're getting e-bikes, actually. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, there's just tens of millions and hundreds of millions of e-bikes just pouring out. I think it'll fundamentally well, if it doesn't transform our, our transportation system in cities, it's gonna push them to the brink, right? New York City is a great example where you know, people are dying because they're getting hit by e-bikes. Uh, there's a whole underclass of delivery people who j that's how they get around the city. And the city has been remarkably unengaged in trying to figure out how do you train or license or um, regulate that, right? So it's going to continue, to, the pressure is going to continue to grow and cyclists are, and, and their advocates are becoming much more assertive about the road and their space on the road. So we're headed towards something, I don't know exactly what yet, but, um, but yeah, it's tense out there. And I, look, I, you know, I'm an I'm a, I'm a everyday bike rider and I just got an e-bike. And I'm like, when I'm with the cars, I'm like, look, I have, I'm going to take my ride away here. I can go 25 miles an hour on that e-bike if I have to. And that's the speed limit, right? So, so it's requiring new forms of cycling etiquette, like they had to figure out back then. But I'm not nodding and saying howdy. <laughs> you can imagine what I'm saying. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Any other questions? Well, the, the manufacturers of bikes that increase the power they have, they increase the speed, and not only with bikes, yeah. Right. I mean, that seems to ruin everything after a while. You know? Oh, it's a race, it's right? Yeah. Twenty miles yeah. an hour, and the next thing you know, they're at fifty miles an hour. They're fifteen hundred watts or yeah. thousand watts. I mean. Yeah, it's so interesting, but there's so, but there's it's there's some unexpected twists and turns in that story, and and one of those is. Um, uh, so people were tinkering and experimenting, right, for, for many decades with the bicycle. They were adding little motors and they were adding wheels and tires and they are figuring out aerodynamics. So Peugeot, for example, uh, in the 1920s is making a mix of three-wheeled bicycles and um, four-wheeled bicycles and cars, right? And there was no, sort. there was just sort of a fluid kind of, there were no real stark boundaries between automobile and pedal-powered vehicles, right? And some of those pedal-powered vehicles were pretty fast. And if you talk to anyone these days who's in to the human-powered vehicle movement, these sort of super aerodynamic tricycles, they can get going really fast with minimal effort, right? But what happened was the, the bicycle industry stepped in in the 1930s and said, 
Bicycle racing will only use two-wheeled bicycles. And that shut down all of that experimentation and tinkering of creating speedy aerodynamic three or four wheel pedal powered machines. So the bicycle industry itself has shut avenues down, right? Um, and yeah, I, I mean, you know, the bicycle industry right now is, you know, it's just going crazy, right? We all know part of it's the pandemic, but like, you know, they've, there, there is a boom in sales right now and there's, we're starting to see a proliferation of bike types, but it's still that traditional two wheel. Yeah. yeah. Um, how did motorcycles fit in in parallel or in opposition to the bicycles? Yeah, it was the, the motorcycles just sort of seamlessly emerged out of bicycles when people put motors on bicycles. And in fact, bike racing pacers in the 1890s were motorcycles. Uh, not as we think of them, it was just a bike with a little motor on it. But um, so, yeah. People were already doing that. And then, you know, the bike dealers, many of them eventually became auto dealers if they lived, if they made it past the 1890s into the early 1900s. Uh, so for, or motorcycle dealers. So for example, that Lane Cycle Livery became an Indian motorcycle dealer in Burlington uh, up until I want to say the 40s or the 50s. So yeah, it was just sort of seamless. It's so interesting now because we, we oppose them, right? We oppose bikes and cars and, and motorcycles. But back then it was, they were all one thing that had multiple faces and iterations. Yeah. I wonder if anyone knows where Prospect Park was in Harvard. Wiz does. <laughs> it was where the industrial park is now. Um, took a right and, or you took a left heading out of town and went up a hill and it was, was up there. There was a ball field up there and there was this, this bike track. Um, I was talking with Lorraine Puzzy a couple weeks ago and she remembers in the 1940s going to ball games up there and she said there were bleachers. I don't know if you noticed in that picture that there were bleachers at the side that people could sit at. But in the 1940s, those bleachers were no longer usable. They were, they were dilapidated. We could continue this over Absolutely. lunch and cookies at the depot. Come and look what we've done to the, um, to the whole exhibit area. It's completely different from the way it has been in the past. Thank you for coming. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it.